uh, the other sessions, which focused on direct market sales, um, online platforms for sales, and uh, UPIC had been recorded, and almost all of them will be up on our on farmfoodsafety.rutgers.edu COVID-19 webpage. Tonight's session will also be recorded um, and will also go up on that webpage. So if you miss anything tonight, or if you know somebody who wanted to tune in, couldn't make it, uh, it will be available to them on there. Um, you'll notice that there is a chat box. If you haven't opened it yet, there should be an icon on the bottom of the screen that looks like a word bubble from a cartoon. If you click on that, that'll open up your chat box and please use that to ask your questions. So that way um, we can we can filter through those and get the questions to the right speaker um, and, and get you the answers that uh, that you're looking for. Please mute yourself if you're not already muted. Uh, we'd appreciate if you mute, mute yourself. Michelle does have supreme power over the mute. So if she sees that noise is coming from your end and you haven't muted yourself, she'll do that. Uh, but it does really help for clarity and being able to understand um, the, the speaker. Uh, so I want to introduce, we've got three panelists, panelists tonight, three farmer panelists. Um, and they're going to talk to you about their operations and the changes that they've made and how they've gone. And maybe they've made multiple changes for certain things just based on the fact that this is the year of change. So first, we're going to hear from Tracy Duffield. Then we'll hear from Dave Specka, and then we'll hear from Jess Niederer, who isn't on yet, but will be plugging in shortly. So, Tracy, thank you for, for being here tonight and being willing to, to talk to people about what you've been up to and the changes you've made. If you could tell us about your operation and uh, some of the things you've been up to this season. Sure. Um, and thanks for having me. So, uh, our farm market has been in business for 55 years. And uh, we farm about 400 acres of fruits and vegetables, and we employ anywhere between 35 to 50 people um, depending on the season. Um, we have uh, the farm market, bakery, and deli, and we're actually open year-round, which was made it even more interesting this year. Um, we have pick-your-own crops. Uh, we do pick-your-own strawberries and peas, and then apples and pumpkins in the fall, uh, and then we do festivals also. So um, some of the changes that we had to make due to the COVID-19, um, as I said, we're open year round. So this kind of all of a sudden transpired. Um, it was for probably, I want to say March 11th is when we started noticing that we were running out of milk and bread. Um, and we kind of got a mad rush of people like we would before a bad snowstorm. And that continued probably for about two weeks uh, where we really couldn't keep stuff on the shelves um, and people were just buying. We couldn't believe the, the quantity of stuff that people were buying. I mean, it was crazy. Um, we had also decided in January that we were going to start uh, a home delivery and a curbside pickup business uh, starting April 1st. But then when this all transpired, we kind of jumped into two and a half weeks early which also made it even crazier because we weren't fully prepared. Um, and it took off to the point where uh, once we got it online, which was about a week in, um, our sales, uh, we went from getting maybe 12 to 15 orders a day to doing anywhere between 55 and 65 orders a day. Um, we then realized too that we had to move things around up front because our registers were too close together. And in order to keep people at a social distance um, and keep people out of the front of the farm market, I mean, you're only working with a certain square footage. So if Michelle knows she's been in our market. It's very, um, the way people walk in, they walk in, go right to the deli and you have a cash register right there. And then there's three on the other side. So we wound up moving one from up front to the back and we processed all of our orders now from the back. Um, and we kind of worked our lines differently so that we can keep people as best at a distance that we can. Um, and, you know, we're just, we have plexiglass up at the registers, obviously the, the helper wearing masks. Um, the girls at the registers are wearing gloves. Uh, 
which gloves aren't mandatory and I think gloves are disgusting. So we basically just keep our hands washed. Um, this past Saturday being a holiday weekend was the first day that we actually had to uh, keep people outside and have a line of people waiting to come in. So that we kind of, you know, we were anxious to see how that would work or wouldn't work. And people were very, um, you know, they didn't give us a problem because basically you're waiting just about everywhere you go. Um, and, you know, as far as in the future, um, we're interested. We haven't started pick your own strawberries yet. We do have uh, st our strawberries in the farm market. We've had them since the end of April and um, but haven't opened the pick your own field yet. And I'm kind of doing a little uh, research to see how everybody else is making out with that. Um, Obviously, we couldn't do any festivals or birthday parties. We usually do Easter Bunny hay rides in the spring. We couldn't do that. Um, and we have not had any birthday parties or field trips. So I'm kind of anxious about what that's going to look like in the fall. Um, but we'll see what happens when that time comes. So, I mean, all in all, it's, it is a lot of change. And I think because we were open, it would have probably been a li little bit easier if we hadn't opened yet and we could get the rules as they come in, but, um, you know, we just kind of did what we had to do when we had to do it and, you know, try to work things out, so. So it sounds like you did a lot of on the fly decision making. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good to hear that your customers were all pretty, you know, responding pretty positively um, about the changes that you've made. And what a, what an incredible increase in volume too of the, the, the orders that you were receiving when you switched to that online. Oh yeah, that was unbelievable. Um, you had to increase your, your staff to, to be able to handle all that? Yes, we did. Actually, we had some staff that left. Um, we did let the employees know that, um, you know, if they did not feel comfortable working in the circumstances that um, they, you know, they didn't have to stay. Um, we had a few that left for that reason. We had a few that left because they were um, in contact with someone that could possibly have it. So they needed to quarantine. Um, but then some of them have come back. So, um, but we did have to we did have to pull in some extra help mainly to process the the orders because that take that has been taking us probably from about eight thirty till about three o'clock in the afternoon. So mind the space that you need to deal with all that too, yeah. right? Yeah. All the staging. We moved all that to the back because, like I said, we were doing that up front because that's where the cash registers were, and then we realized it it just was too congested, so um, we moved that to the back. So, well, Michelle pulled up your your Facebook page. You want to talk about your strategy with how you've been using Facebook during this time? Sure. We, uh, actually, my nieces both do the Instagram and the Facebook, which I'm very, very thankful for because there's not really been any extra time to do that. Um, but we just, you know, their biggest thing is to just try to engage every day with the customers and let them know that we're still there and we still have you know, well, right now with the strawberries, um, you know, we're keeping them informed with that. Um, we did have a little issue over Easter. Um, we were talking about that before we started where we didn't really know we had, we have hay rides to the Easter Bunny house. And so early on, we decided we weren't going to have it at the house. It was going to all strictly be outside in the open air. And we kind of left it at that until we heard from the governor and right away people were Kind of all over us about you know not um, about still even having it that it was irresponsible and so we kind of put a statement out there that we were waiting to hear what the governor said and then you know we would kind of process that as a family and decide what our next step would be and obviously we didn't have it but um, they were very quick to you know criticize <laughs> So, and like I said, yeah. we were just so busy. We really didn't, it kind of wasn't on the front burner. And, you know, so it was like, we'll deal with that when we have time to deal with that. And, you know, obviously think positive until the governor says otherwise. So, yeah. but that could be so stressful. I'm glad you were busy with other things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Michelle showing your all the, the comments that you get on your on your post. So that's great that you have somebody who's dedicated to managing your social media just because it's it's living, right? It's lots of things are happening there and lots of questions I would imagine are coming in that way also that need to be responded to. Yes, we're a lot of questions now are coming in about the pick your own. And you know, we have full intentions to do it. We probably won't start until June, um, which I'm realizing is now in another week. Um, but as soon as you know, we do have a plan set you know, we're going to start putting that up on Facebook and let them know what our our, our rules are going to be. Um, so, I mean, obviously we'll be doing the rules that are being brought down. Um, but I, I could see, um, I think we had, uh, my niece was looking on Johnson's farm because they were saying how they had a lot of people complaining about wearing masks. And um, so... We'll do our homework first. Yeah. Well, we did create for you pick uh, Rutgers has a has guidelines or guidance that's yes. up on the page to help talk you through the executive orders and how to comply with them because they are right. They're broad executive yeah. orders that aren't specific to agriculture, which makes it really hard. Um, and also, right, depending on your county, the rules can vary also. So. And particularly with Johnson's in Burlington County, even like if you're on county park land, you have to have a face covering on. So that sort of helps a farmer in terms of saying, listen, the parks are outside and they have to wear a face covering. My farm is in a park, it's a private business. So should, you know, I get to make decisions too. So anyway, um, okay. Did, did, all right, so are we ready to, Michelle, you think we're ready to move on to, to Dave? Sounds good. All right, David, now you know the drill. <laughs> Thank you, Tracy. That was great. Um, we'll, we'll swing back around for questions. Okay, no problem. Oh, you're muted, Dave. How's that? There we go. All right, great. So uh, also, thanks for having me on tonight, too. It's always great to be able to share information amongst the, the folks who are on the front line having you know, to deal with these things on, on a day-by-day -day basis. And I certainly want to give my hats off to the extension service because you guys have done a, a great job of, of getting everyone up to date on, on more recent developments as they come along and trying to interpret what's being said. So it's been a big help for us, I know that for sure. So thanks a lot for that. So I just wanted to, to just quickly give you a, a, an idea of, of what our operation is. We're located in Springfield Township, Burlington County, New Jersey. Um, we're actually a third and fourth generation farmers now. My, my grandfather and father moved over from a farm they had in Philadelphia to, to Burlington County back in the, the mid fifties, 1950s. And um, during that time, uh, since then, it's low, but sure, they've built up a, a, a UPIC business, and, and now that's primarily our, our business on the farm is, is UPIC. Uh, we have a 125-acre preserved farm. Uh, three people work for us full-time. That includes my husband, Stephen, uh, and I work part-time, but my wife is also full-time on the farm. And uh, we have, depending on the season, between 12 and 15 people that, that assist us at the farm. Um, our clientele uh, are mostly immigrants uh, from from a variety of different countries. We we have flags representing the different customers that have come in to to pick at the farm. I would say we probably have forty or fifty different flags. Um, so it's a bit of a challenge, not only um, with complying with the COVID nineteen regulations, but getting that uh, in, a, in a format that they can understand and 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 hopefully, you know. Mainly by by demonstration, most of the folks seem to be you know aware and and and, and uh, appreciate and what it is that we ask for them. In addition to the UPIC farm, we also have a farm market. It's about three miles away, uh, called the Corn Stop, and uh, that opened just last week. Uh, the UPIC farm operates from April uh, through through December, so about nine months out of the year. Uh, the UPIC or the farm market rather just opened last week and and so we're we're kind of learning there too what, what's going to work and 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 not regarding the regulations that, that need to be complied with um, but it's on a highway that 
Excuse me. Get that out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> Has to jump in on the screen just in just to make a, a, a guest appearance. But anyway, uh, she's always a bug. But anyway, the uh, the the market itself um, is on a highway where we uh, get a lot of shore traffic, and so uh, we're not quite sure what to expect because uh, even though. It seems as though people are anxious to get down the shore. How many of them are actually going to do it? And is there going to be issues with, you know, rentals not wanting to, to go down for a week, not knowing who was there before them and, and so forth. So, so time will tell on that one. Uh, but uh, that, those are our primary markets. Uh, we don't do any, any uh, like festival festivals or, or CSAs. Um, we just ha strictly have the, the pick your own. Um, so some of the changes that, that we had to make uh, was primarily around our, our checkout. Uh, we, we have a shed that we keep the registers and scale in and, and the, uh, the folks who do the checking out basically are inside the shed and customers bring the product from the field up to the market. And, uh, and so, or up to the scale rather. And before they basically would just queue up in a line and once they were checked out, they would turn around and walk back out again, same direction they came in. And certainly with, with the, uh, the social distancing regulations, that wasn't going to work anymore. So we put uh, two folding tables uh, in front of the doorway. Uh, that ensures that, that they're six feet away from, from the, the clerk doing the checkout. Um, and then after they pay, they exit a different way than they came in. Uh, so they're not doubling back onto the, the folks who are waiting in line. Um, we've also got a, a, a gravel driveway that we've painted uh, marks on um, that are six feet apart. So they know, you know, how to, where, where to stand approximately to, to stay that, that six foot distance. Um, we also have implemented a, a requirement for hand washing. So we have a hand washing station near the parking lot as they come in uh, that they have to, to uh, wash their hands um, before they go out into the fields. And, and we recommend that they do it once again, once they get back to the scale house. Um, and then we also have a, a required uh, face cover policy. Um, we we're talking about this a little bit before uh, the, the meeting today as to you know, whether or not it's, it's really required outdoors, but a lot of folks think that it's not, but, but actually, according to the governor's um, mandates, uh, it, it is required. And uh, so we, we explain that to our, our customers. Most of them are more than happy to comply, uh, but they don't always do it, uh, not, not all of them do it willingly and are willing to start an argument as to you know why why should we be doing that? This is a lot of hype and and so on and so forth. Uh, but for the most part, the customers do it. Uh, they they appreciate that everyone else is doing it, and that we mandate it. And uh, and so that seems to work uh, for our, for the better. Um, although it's not always complied with. Um, as far as picking in the field goes, uh, we, we're picking strawberries right now, and uh, we started on Mother's Day weekend. Um, our beds are six foot wide, or our wheelbase is six foot. So we couldn't have people picking in every row because if they were facing towards each other, they would be closer than six foot. So we set up a system. We have what we call our field marshal who's in the field. That's where people check in and they get their, their quartz or their trays, whatever they want to pick into. And we assign them every other row. Um, and usually we have a, a line forming you know, in the morning when we're starting out. Uh, we've, we've seen a much stronger turnout for your own uh, for strawberries anyway. Um, and uh, so pretty much fill up every other row fairly quick. Um, then we'll have the, the rest of the group who hasn't been assigned a row yet. Um, wait uh, for approximately 10 to 15 minutes. So people who are picking uh, can get down into the field a little bit. And then we start the next round of, of pick your owns on the alternating. Row. So. Not only are they you know, another 20 feet up the row, but they're also on, on a, an alternating row. So there's a little bit of distance there as well. That way, if they catch up to each other, there's, there's still some distancing going on. Um, and that seems to have worked pretty well. We have them enter uh, through one end of the field and exit through the other. So even if they don't pick the whole row, uh, we ask them to leave from the other end to go back to the scale house. Um, if they get to the end of the row, and they don't have as many berries as they would like to pick, then we ask them 
to just come back around the front again. They can get in front of the line and then we'll assign them another row to pick from. We have about uh, 50 alternating rows all together. Uh, so we can accommodate up to, to 50 families or 50 groups at a time. Um, for our other crops that we currently have, we, we had things like broccoli, rob, and spinach, and, uh, uh, Swiss chard, and some other crops that, that aren't so popular. In those cases, we ask the customers to, um, to just keep their distance from each other. Uh, when they're in the field, we don't, we don't supervise that part of it so much. Um, and, uh, and that seems to have been okay too. We, we don't get any complaints from the customers that, that other folks were, were, were uh, in too close to them when they were picking. Um, let me see, I got some notes here about some things. Uh, one of the things that, that some of our customers were asking for uh, is whether we could carry other products. Uh, you know, uh, we normally have maybe local honey, eggs, asparagus that's grown locally available at the scale. Uh, but the customers were really uh, wanting other products. So we've added other products to, to what we offer at the scale house uh, for retail, um, including things like tomatoes and potatoes and onions. Obviously, some of these things aren't being grown locally. Uh, but it's something that they they uh, want to buy. Uh, they feel that the outdoor environment is is much more um, healthy than than being in a crowded grocery store, and and that's worked out pretty well for us. In that situation, we do bag the products uh, that are small enough to bag. Obviously, things like watermelons aren't going to work, uh, or or other melons, uh, but the potatoes, uh, the tomatoes, uh, all the other products that are fairly small uh, do get bagged. Um, that way, the, the, the customers are not handling the, the food, um, the, the product that's on display. That's worked pretty good. Um, things that have not worked so well uh, in, in trying to comply with some of the COVID-19 requirements uh, at the farm market, and again, we've only been open for a week, uh, but bagging the produce there just does not seem to be working for the customers or for us. Uh, it's a lot of extra labor, and it's something that, that we um, just don't seem to, to have uh, enough coordinated effort to be able to offer things bagged, nor do the customers want them to be bagged. Uh, but they are sold in baskets and, and bushels that they bring to the, the checkout counter. And from there, we, we put it in a plastic bag and then we set into the baskets before they go back out on display again. Uh, so we feel that we're controlling it that way. Um, and at the farm market, that's where we're also seeing more pushback on requiring a face mask. It's, a, it's an open market. Um, there's a lot of fresh air, and I guess some people are under the impression that you don't need to have a mask in that situation. But but I'm being told that yes, indeed, they are they are required to have it. Um, I think in in going forward, um, some of the things that we'll continue to do that that seem to have, have been an eye opener for us with all this is that um, bringing produce from from in from others, local farms and, and, and other produce available through the, through the Philadelphia Produce Terminal and, and other locations um, seems to be adding to the bottom line for us. Um, I don't know if it's just an effect of our current regulations, but um, it's something that, that um, we see as a benefit for, for our customers and, and for, for our revenue since we have the people there at the scale house already. Um, I think we're going to continue to have the hand washing requirement so that um, when people come in, it's expected that they're going to wash their hands. And I think, Meredith, this may speak to some food safety regulations as well, because then potentially you're not bringing people in. I see Michelle scrolling on the picture that's there now. We, we, we have an aerial photo and we kind of marked out where it is that, that people can park. So when they come, they can kind of see uh, what we expect in terms of uh, where they'll park and, and where the scale house is, how it's all related and I'll know ahead of time. Um, and, uh, and then the other thing that we think is working pretty well is this field marshalling. So on crops that are very popular, like strawberries, and it would be things like maybe uh, green beans and, and other crops where we get a big crowd on opening day, uh, having someone there in the field to assign rows and then have them leave the opposite end of the field so someone else coming behind them can, can pick up uh, where they left off is, is seems to work pretty good for us if we're going to continue to do that. Um, so that's a quick summary of what we're up to. 
So yeah, Michelle's been just scrolling through all your Facebook page page posts and right. So it's clear you've got somebody who dedicates a decent amount of time to communicating through Facebook. Do you want to talk about how you communicate with your customers about how much quantity of products left in the field and when you're picked out? Sure. Um, so that's a, a really good question because of this, this increased demand that I've mentioned. Um, and, and compounding that problem is that it's been a cool, cool season so far. So our strawberries aren't ripening as quick as they normally would. So we've got a, a reduced quantity and, and, a, and a higher number of people wanting to pick. So um, we have uh, Wendy Byer working for us, who's, who's really a, a great person at working with Facebook. She's the one who posts all of our notices. Um, we open the fields typically at 830. Sometimes by 10 o'clock, they're, they're pretty well picked off. Um, and we've got people driving in for sometimes up to an hour away that could be en route by the time we're sold out. So we try to get Wendy to post as soon as possible when we estimate the field's going to close. Um, and, and, then, um, and then as it gets to be that time, we usually sort of are, are uh, over conservative. So we have an extra half an hour or so that we can stay open and people can go to get in there if they have driven a distance and, and still get some berries. Um, and all that is communicated through Facebook. Um, you know, the answering machine is gonna take care of it because not a lot of people are gonna call in. And uh, so this for us seems to be the, the most effective method to let them know that, uh, that we're gonna be sold out. Yeah, and they probably show up once without consulting Facebook and learn it the hard way, right? And then they know they right. they don't come without checking. Yeah, this is true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah because they bring their kids with them, and, and you feel bad having to turn them away. But it's it's something that unfortunately I don't want them to go out there and pick green berries that they're going to be really disappointed with. I yeah. come back, so we we try and tell them when when's their best chance to get some more berries. All right, well, thank you, Dave. I think we'll move over to Jess, who has joined us. All right, here I am. How are you this evening? Doing fine. Yeah, yeah. hectic day. Yeah, yeah. So I um, think I've got about the format that you all are looking for for us to introduce our operation. So I'll just launch into it. And then um, if there's something that's missing, please let me know and I will over that too. Um, so our farm is a 15 acre organic vegetable farm. We sell entirely um, direct to consumers at farmers markets. We do have a CSA program that also runs through the farmers markets. Um, we have 650 members right now. We had 550 members before the pandemic hit. Um, and then people panic bought CSA shares. Um, our CSA is typically about 40 to 45% of our business and the rest of our sales come directly from customers at those farmers markets. Um, we attend markets year round. We grow in a number of high tunnels um, and employ staff year round. In the winter, we have, I guess, what would be equivalent of you know, four and a half full-time people. And then in the summer, we have nine full-time people on the farm. Um, working on the farm. Um, we we have extremely limited pick your own. Uh, we find most of our customers aren't actually interested in it. Um, so we we don't do much pick your own. And this year we had time to really change the layout as well. Um, so we go to six weekly farmers markets. In the winter we go to about five weekly farmers markets, so they don't run every week. And um, when stuff started to get kind of crazy in March, winter farmers markets almost all entirely dropped like flies. Um, so just it shut down, closed their doors. Everybody was panicking and freaking out. The only one that stayed open was the one on the Rutgers campus, actually, the Cook's Market. Um, so we had a lot of early season um, adjustments to make or how to continue to sell our products. Um, we had never ever done any kind of online sales before at all. And we set up an online store and entirely moved to a pre-ordering system for all of our sales. 
And that's mostly how we're still moving everything now. Um, we use a website called Local Line that allows us to set inventory numbers for what we have available in the week. Um, it allows us to set lead times for when ordering will close before the market. And um, it also allows us to set up the way our CSA members check out differently from the way our uh, cash customers check out. So the CSA members don't have to pay um, to check out with their order, whereas everybody else that's not a CSA member does have to check out. Say our CSA isn't um, like a prearranged box of stuff and never has been. It's always been people um, picking out the, the precise vegetables and quantities that they wanted and having that debit down with the account that they started with us. Um, the first week we did pre-ordering, I think we had uh, maybe 35 orders and now we're up to 500 orders a week. Um, and it will continue going up from there. Um, we, we also, so the farmers markets are almost entirely open now. So we're almost up to a full farmers market weekly schedule. Um, they, every market has done things differently in terms of what their requirements are of the farmers and of the customers. Um, but the orders work well for all of the markets and doing the those orders, the pre-ordering, that's also the most comfortable for our staff right now. You think of a farmer's market and um, it's like a bustling place, a lot of people, a lot of um, person traffic. And um, that's gross at the moment <laughs> with a lot of people packed in together. So if we're able to, take those customers and quickly get them through our stand, get them their vegetables, get them out, then we don't have lines um, of people in close contact with each other. And if it's the orders, we also don't have our staff have to check people out and come into any kind of prolonged proximity to anybody. Um, so we're really pushing our customers to use that ordering system um, even though at the markets, we have two other ways that people can get produce. Um, we do find we have customers that are not super tech savvy and have um, continuously stumbled when trying to use the online store. So we have something called a farmer's choice bag at the markets. We have two different sizes, the $15 size and the $25 size. Those bags are prepacked produce of that value. Um, that a customer can grab on the site and pay that that easy amount and go. Um, we're also in some of the markets where our staff feels comfortable doing it are having a limited selection of a la carte items. So we're capping that at 10 different items, whereas in the normal season, we'd have 40 and upwards of different things that we would have available at market. Um, Part of the reason we're capping that is again, so we can keep those lines streamlined and get people in and out quickly. It's gonna be the 10 most profitable and popular items. Um, but we also want to be incentivizing our customers to use the online ordering system, which again, is by far the most comfortable for our staff to be moving people over. Now, honestly, I think it's gonna end up being the most comfortable for customers to not have to worry about a line as they approach our stand. Um, I think everybody's getting a little speed out like that right now. Um, so in some of the ways the different markets have been setting this up, um, we only have one market that's currently allowing customers to touch the products. So that does mean staffing is interesting. So you, we have to have enough staff to be able to pack all of the items for the for all of the customers. Um, and that that anything that's in the a la carte setting that's not pre-packed and ready to go. So that's a pretty big staff burden and another reason we'd prefer people to be pre-ordering and keeping the availability of the a la carte items at a minimum. Um, so that's five out of six markets that aren't allowing customers to touch the product. Only the vendors selling are allowed to touch the products and vend the products. 
Um, we have one market that is entirely drive through now. So all of the or all of the produce and everything sold has to be pre ordered. And then they queue up their cars and drive past every vendor, hold up their name to their car window, pop their trunk, and we stick their order in their trunk. And that's the way all the vendors in the market are, are getting stuff to people. The thing about that one is where we've really seemed to have capped out how much we're selling at that market. Um, and that does bring the concern up that I don't anticipate that we are going to have the same revenues from farmers markets this year as we have in the past, other than the markets where we have a strong CSA population, because that doesn't seem like our CSA members are ordering less than they would typically be checking out for. So the CSA members are um, looking to be carrying us this season. And we had temporarily stopped sales of CSA when people were doing the panic buying thing and we're opening them back up now. Um, now that I think people might be actually reading more about what they are buying rather than just dropping $400 without really understanding what the season is going to be. Um, yeah, so I think uh, a lot of our markets, we could basically be continuing with a normal setup just with extra staffing to handle the the touching packaging of people's selections um except that i'm not going to ask my staff to do anything that they're not comfortable doing and um just felt nobody is comfortable with that setup at the, with like a normal farmers market setup right now so even though it could certainly be a financial hit, um, there's you can't ask you can't, people are not your slaves when they're working for you. You gotta work with what they're willing to do, and I'm not that. I personally don't feel that much the whole situation. I've got two babies at home. I have twins that are maybe immune compromised, maybe not. They were six months premature, so um, I'm not really looking for a prolonged customer contact with hundreds of people every Saturday either. I'd like people to purchase the drop and go stuff and keep it at that. Um, this has been a huge change for the way we do business. Uh, this it, it doesn't look anything like what we've done in previous years. We've changed everything about our weekly schedule. Um, we had to spend an insane amount of time doing support for the online store as we got our hundreds of customers um, registered and understanding how to use it. Um, that's also, you know, I have a flip phone. I am not a good person to do tech support. So that has also been extremely challenging. But um, I think we've, we're on a roll now. We've created, you know, the in-house support documents to send to customers that are having a hard time using that online store. Um, it's, it does seem like the the stormy part of it all is over, and now we know what we're doing, which is yeah. You had to make a ton of decisions like overnight, especially with those winter market changes. But then you've changed your planting too. You've made some different decisions with planting. That's correct. Thanks for reminding me about that. So um, we have those. We have four pretty large high tunnels there. 30 feet by 200 feet. And we normally completely flip those over from winter crops and winter greens um, into ginger, tomatoes, cucumbers all at one time. Um, and this year we decided to take the pain in the butt move to intercrop those tunnels. Um, so we do still have all of those summer crops in the tunnels, but there are winter or like cold, cold loving greens growing along the sides so that we would continue to have produce um, when we would normally see a bit of a gap in the spring b before um, planted crops from outside would come in. And thank goodness, because this spring has been disgustingly miserable and cold and everything late. And I think from now on, we'll probably just do this same thing um, because we were able to have a massive amount of produce much faster that way. Um, one of the other things we did differently, we typically go to a plant sale and sell 
plant starts. Um, it's the Mercer County Master Gardener sale. It's um, done really well for us in previous years and they closed that sale. So we also moved all of our plant start sales to an online form and found that that works much better for us. Um, there's far less lugging around plants to farmers markets, packing up the leftovers, bringing them back in the truck, having um, you know an unsecured shelf fall over and top half of the tomatoes. Um, we were able to sell in all of our plants um, in the online ordering system. So that was, we're gonna do that every year now. It was far more efficient to do it that way. Well, and then you had the Master Gardener plant sale, which you grow a ton of plants for that got canceled last minute also. Yeah. That's, and that's why we moved to online ordering. And it was also, I mean, everybody's growing a COVID victory garden right now. So that could be part of why the plant sales went so well, but we're not going back. How did you make the decision with local line versus all the other ones that are out there? Yeah, so I did trial um, a one called Gray's Cart, and that one I actually liked better. But the subscription for that one would have been probably around a thousand dollars a month for our order volume. Um, so that's pretty high, you know. I'll deal with a little bit more of a clunky site if uh, the subscription isn't that high. So for local line um, with the CSA capability, it's one hundred and twenty dollars a month. And another thing that influenced that decision is that we have um, one farmer's market manager who is a crazy researcher of things. So he makes, um, so he, he, when he's making policies at the market that I think are nitpicky, I think he's a pain in the butt. But when, <laughs> when he is in charge of researching a whole system, he's going to do a really good job of like looking at all the different options, picking the right thing. And he did a really good job of settling on local line. Um, and he actually got Edible Jersey to also get hooked up with local line. So um, they're promoting markets that are using that, uh, that e-commerce site. Um, so one of the things I didn't mention about our online ordering is that some of the farmers markets we attend, a customer can use local line through the market hub. So for example, the Denville farmers market has its own site for local line. Many of the vendors at the Denville farmers market have um, posted their products on that site. A customer can go and order everything they wanted from those vendors in one web experience, so the payments get shuttled off to each, each farm or each vendor separately. And then our inventory is all on that same site. We don't have to manage inventory separately for separate markets. We don't have to manage invoicing separately for second mar separate markets. It all is the same interface for us when we, re when we are downloading what we have to pack for all the different markets. So it's really convenient for customers. We now, I think four of our markets are doing it um, through. Yeah, that's impressive. It's great. And um, as you might suspect, like once we, because we were doing this early on, we did somewhat pressure the, our other markets to do that. <laughs> Works out very well for us. Um, so that's part of the reason why local line, I didn't go and try to figure out all these different e-commerce options myself um, because it would have killed me. I mostly just asked other farmers what they were doing and then also trusted the market manager who did the bulk of the research on this because he is an extremely, extremely detail-oriented gentleman. Um, so he was likely to have figured this out pretty well too. Yeah, But for us, the big thing was also allowing CSA members and cash customers to be using the same system because we, I cannot, I do not have the capacity to manage two different online inventories um, throughout the growing season. It would kill me. Um, so, Meredith or Michelle, were there other things that I should have covered generally? No, that was great. And it was a really good overview of all the hoops that, that the three of you have had to jump through. And yeah, like you said, Jess, hopefully 
the worst of it's behind you. And now it's just a matter of getting through the rest of the season and hopefully not too many more decisions need to be made. Um, but um, yeah, we're, we're just at about, um, we're at 745. So it would be great to have questions from those of you that are in on the call. I see Tanwin commented that local line does not allow scheduling time slots if you are considering it for farm market pickups. If I could address and if I could address what we've done to advantage that it is true um, that you can't schedule time slots unless you picked multiple, you could pick multiple, you could make multiple pickup sites. Um, it would be a pain in the butt to do it that way. Um, but you do have a checkout message you can have for each of your pickup sites in the local line. And in the checkout message, you write to people how we would like them to meter themselves as they're showing up for pickup at the markets. Um, and it's basically optional that they follow the rules, but everybody has wanted to follow the rules to avoid crowds so far. So we have in our um, checkout notes for the different pickup sites how we would like them to arrive based off of what their last name is. Um, and that's uh, that's been very successful. We've had really good um, communication from our mem like our members and customers that that's working well. We have one pickup site where 200 people picked up last week um, and it was never crowded because people did follow the rules about metering their arrivals. So again, that's, you know, asking people to not behave like idiots, but mostly <laughs> they've voluntarily been smart. Yeah. Tracy, what, what online platform are you guys using? So we're using um, JotForm and we have a page where they can go in and order. Um, like I said, we jumped into this very quickly. It's not what we're gonna stay with um, because we use uh, Squarespace for our website and they have like a whole commerce uh, page that we can use and go through that. We had a couple issues in the beginning with the whole credit card deal. Like, um, and we were told that we have two Amish markets near us. They were both having the same problem. So, but because we were so busy, nobody really had any time to research. I need a man like uh, she has, that Jess has, <laughs> that research as well. Um, so we're gonna actually look at that because we're gonna keep doing the deliveries um, and pickups for the, you know, the rest of the our times, I guess um, we're not just doing it because of COVID-19, but um, so we're going to actually look into that. It what what we're doing has been working. So um, we actually let the form has made been made up to our store. So if people are regular customers and we have a lot of customers that have been using it, they can pretty much just shop around the store and and order their food. So um, it's working for us, but that's not what we're going to stay with. Yeah, I think it will be interesting once we're through all of this, right? To see what sticks and what what changes make sense, and and I'm just hoping that that we all get some efficiencies out of this, right? If there's going to be a bright spot, that maybe we'll get some efficiencies. So, Jess, I see you answered the question about how much time you're giving people in terms of that. So that window, I'm I'm guessing for for people to pick up their items. So it looks at the drive through market a half an hour window, so much shorter than the other markets, which is an hour and a half. Um, okay, Dave, and thank you for working with barn to door for your farm market online system, but so far you like it. Yeah, it seems like there's a good number of platforms out there. And it's just a matter of everybody reporting on what, how they're doing with it. Because it all looks pretty until you go to use it, right? <laughs> Meredith, if I could say the National Young Farmers Coalition had put together a document that's available on their website that has brief descriptions of all the different um, e-commerce e farm oriented um, sites that they had looked into. Um, so that is a, a somewhat helpful document to look at, but it came out after we had already been uh, running with this. 
Yeah, and Steve, that's the document you used for for your session, right? Oh, it was you Bill, but yeah. On... yeah, that okay. was there. Yeah, that was what we used. Yeah. yeah. And um, really yeah, good, did you get any Kat. feedback from others? Well, you know, it's strange. One of the ones I hear people are using, believe it or not, is Open Table, and they're using that to schedule reservations for farm market try to limit the number of people that are at the farm market. And some people are even using it for scheduling pickups um, with it. There's, you know, you book your, you see how many tables they've adapted the open table to their farm market. That's creative. <laughs> Do we have any other questions from the group? been really great information. Um, we really appreciate you guys coming out and being willing to share everything that you've learned. I know you're all sleep deprived <laughs> and tired and it's it's been a lot and, and uh, but I hope I hope it really does end up being a good season in terms of that that renewed focus on local and and I mean it's a testament right that that residents, when they think of safe, they're thinking of our farms. And so thank goodness. Um, and that, and they think of you as part of their family. Right? And, and I think the more you communicate with them about what you're doing to. To keep them safe, to keep your employees safe, the more buy in you, that you get from them too. And, uh, and then having thick skin for the ones that just want to rail about something and find your website to, to do it. Um, Meredith, I just. Went ahead and put that link to that young farmers okay. page up on the chat window. Yep. And previously, Michelle had put up the the website for the on farm food safety team, our COVID nineteen information page. That's where we've got all the information specific to COVID nineteen um, for production agriculture. So the printable signage is up there, guidance documents, things that we're creating here in New Jersey, and that. Um, have good resources coming from other places also. Oh, thanks, Michelle. That's that's the the website there. So we update that regularly as and things there, continue to change. Meredith, there was a question in chat if any of the farm markets have special hours for immunocompromised or special groups to come in on their own. I don't know if anyone wants to answer that. We we uh, this is Tracy. We haven't um, we didn't do anything like that. Uh, we noticed that we were getting a pretty good rush first thing in the morning, but not it, it was not over capacity. So, um, like I said, we would have changed things um, if we saw that was an issue. But pretty much, you know, like I said, the first time we actually have a line waiting at the door was this past Saturday. I think that was just because of the holiday weekend and we had strawberries. We do normally at this time of the year, we we will change our hours until seven, but we decided we were going to keep it at six for a while longer. So just because we're kind of jeopardizing our employees and we figured, you know, one less hour. I don't know if it makes a whole bunch of a difference, but, um, you know, we're, we're just not going to change it yet. Yeah, we we don't have any kind of um, uh, special for for immunocompromised people either. Not sure how we could make it work. Yeah, well, that isn't a requirement, right? It's it's a when possible situation, and your customers will let you know, right? If they're if they're upset about it and they want it, then then you'd probably hear from them about it. Right. All right, well, it doesn't look like we have any more questions in the mix here. So thank you all for participating and thanks for our for for Jess, Tracy and, and Dave for for talking to us tonight. Um, this Michelle is recording this, so we will put this up with the other recordings um, on the food safety website. Um, and again, please share any of these with with folks who couldn't chime in. I know it's hard at uh, at the end of a day when it's still light outside. We always pray for rain on these things because then we get a better turnout. But <laughs> but today that was not the case. So I hope it was a productive day for everybody. 
Michelle, you have anything to add? Steve, Bill? I just want to say I'm very grateful for all of you coming on and sharing your experiences. I think, you know, we all learn from you and I think it's a great networking capability that we can bring growers to speak to growers. And like I said, we learn from you as much as I think you learn from us. So it's a great partnership. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Have a great evening, everybody. And um, just remember extension still actively working during this time. So reach out to your agent if you need anything. All right, thank you. Take care. Bye -bye.